Now for everybody's least favorite unit, probably just me projecting, genetics. Study of variation and inheritance in humans, or every animal, and plants even. Basic unit of inheritance is a gene, because genes are what code for a protein. So a gene is a heritable factor that controls a specific characteristic. For example, you have a gene for eye color, height, etc. Well, some of these are a little more complex, because some of these may be polygenic inheritance, or linked inheritance. But typically, animals or plant cell nucleuses have thousands of genes. Humans have around 22,333. And all the genes of an organism is called a genome, the collective, such as the Human Genome Project, which was uh, mapped out up until recently. And basically, this genome will contain literally every piece of genetic information about you, because your genes are made up of DNA. Genes are part of much larger DNA molecules called chromosomes. So the tier is chromosome, smaller is genes, and even smaller is DNA. And then uh, specific little things that code for each amino acid is a codon. And then even smaller is just a base. DNA wrapping, there's this short part about how um, DNAs are wrapped into histones using proteins and supercoiling DNA, chromatin. And this is like the size. This is a chromosome. Prokaryotes, like E. coli, have a single chromosome coiled up and concentrated in the nucleoid region, and others may also have rings of DNA called plasmids. John Cairns' technique for measuring length of DNA molecules by autoradiography. I think this is an important point that Ivy wants you to know. Human beings have 23 pairs of chromosomes in each cell. The first 22 are called autosomal, which means they're bodily or somatic chromosomes, and the last pair are sex, so 22, autosomal, the last 23rd one is the sex chromosome, XY or XX. Each chromosome is visible as a double structure. The two parts are called chromosomes connected by a centromere. So this is two chromatids, or well, four chromatids, and then linked together by centromeres. And the two parts are chromatids. So these, this is one chromatid and one chromatid. Each pair is called a homologous pair, one for mom and one from dad, and they should like align with each other for the same traits. Each pair is the same genes found arranged in the same linear sequence. The position of a gene within the chromosome itself is called a gene locus, such as this, or loci for multiple. Each chromosome has approximately a thousand genes. The chromosome number is an important characteristic of the species. So our n number is 23, meaning this is how many we have in our haploid cells. And our two n number is 46, how many chromosomes we have in our, dip in our diploid cells. Genome size is the total number of DNA base pairs in one copy of a haploid genome. So for us, it's around 3.2, 3.3 billion base pairs. A karyogram is a diagram or photograph of the chromosomes. And a karyogram is only taken during metaphase, where they're lined up in the middle and easy to see. And they're arranged in homologous pairs of decreasing size. And this is how you can tell whether someone has a certain trait. A karyotype is a property of the cell described by the number and type of the chromosomes present. So the karyogram would inform me about the karyotype because this is the photo, like a gram, and the karyotype is what we have. So to produce, the chromosome must be visible in cells undergoing mitosis. So yeah, metaphase, I was right. And stains such as dye are used to show the distinctive banding patterns that aren't actually that distinctive because they're really hard to see during that lab we did. And a micrograph is taken, cut out, and arranged into pairs by size, shape, and banding pattern. This is a valid job. Often used to detect abnorm abnormalities, such as when you have Down syndrome, trisomy 21, an extra copy of the chromosome 21 for three copies present, instead of two. Cell division. Oh, great. New cells are produced by the division of existing cells. If many cells are needed, cells go through the cycle of events again and again, called the cell division cycle. So there's G1, S, sandwiched between G1 and G2. Then this mitosis and cytokinesis part is actually a small segment of the cell division cycle. So just remember in S, all your DNA is replicated. This is really important. I keep seeing it in paper two practices. G1, the cellular contents aside from the chromosomes are duplicated. So this is where I think your mitochondria number increases. I remember that was a big focal point for a bunch of questions. G2 is preparation for mitosis, so any last changes. Mitosis and cytokinesis is only the small segment. Mitosis involves the somatic cells, 
and has PMAT stage, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase 4. After mitosis, the cell physically splits in half through cytokinesis. So here's some of the notes he took. So interphase is what uh, your chromosomes are long and thread-like uncoiled, and then they are doubled by the end of interphase. Yep, so the DNA replicates. So this is where all that uh, nucleic acid information comes in handy. Mitosis, your 46 chromosomes turn into two cells with 46 chromosomes each. Meiosis, you actually have your chromosomes into haploid. And so you actually end from, you start from a 46 chromosome haploid cell into four different diploid cells, I believe. Prophase, prophase is where the, the nuclear membrane begins to break down and then the centrioles move to the sides. And this, these are the 9 plus 0, remember, to form basal bodies. Uh, no, not to form basal bodies, to form these spindle fibers, the pull chromosomes. Metaphase, the nuclear membrane has disappeared. M for middle, which means the chromosomes line up in the middle like this. And they line up in a uh, single file. And the spindle fibers begin to form and we'll get ready to pull them by the centromere. Anaphase, they are pulled by the centromere and the chromatids are yanked apart from the chromosomes. Telophase and cytokinesis, the cell membrane, uh, the cell splits down the middle now that the chromatids are split up. And you have two separate chromatid, 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 like this, for two different cells. And now you have a fresh set. Meiosis, similarly, uh, is for the, it occurs in the gonads, which is just fancy for penis, vagina, etc. Uh, testes in the male, ovaries in the females, and are used to produce gametes, sex cells, sperms in males, and eggs and ovaries in females. And as we said, as I said earlier, it's the haploid number, so it's half of the number of chromosomes. So what happens instead is PMAT actually occurs twice. Everything happens the same, except things line up in pairs, and there's a crossing over stage, which happens in prophase, which means pieces exchange with each other for genetic diversity. And your metaphase there'll be pairs lining up like this the uh, op opposing pairs from your parents and they're yanked apart still by the centromere but their chromatids are not pulled apart by the spindle fibers instead entire chromosomes are pulled this process halves the chromosome number aka reduction division important term then telophase one you create two cells from this chromosome and basically uh each of these cells go through mitosis is what happens and the exact same stuff happens. You end up with four different cells, but now you'll notice they have half of the number of chromatids each. And it's genetically diverse, which means the cells are not identical because you you don't want your children to be the exact same as you. Otherwise, that'd be really bad. Alleles. Although one particular chromosome type always has the same genes in a sequence, the genes themselves can vary. So even though they might always code for hair, um, the thing that codes for hair might be different in itself. You might have different hair color. So that's what an allele is, where the, these things are the same, except for a slight difference. So B and B are alleles of each other, because this little, on this loci, this little gene sequence, they're, they match up with each other, but this difference is a um, just a slight change. Non-disjunction. Sometimes chromosomes that should separate by moving over, like when these spindle fibers move uh, pull things, they just don't. They just mess up, they stick around, or they get pulled extra. And this is non-disjunction, and it can occur during meiosis 1 or 2. And this results in gametes with either too many or too few chromosomes. And gametes will either quickly die, but if they have uh, too many chromosomes, uh, unlike too few, gametes can sometimes survive and children will be born and they might have Down syndrome, trisomy 21. Um, this is a pedigree chart. There is a key right here for how to read it. So um, colored will mean um, affected, and you can use this to infer things about the alleles and genotypes. Homozygous means to have two identical alleles of a gene. So that means you're fully dominant, fully recessive, AA, AA. Heterozygous means that you have two different alleles of the gene, which means you have one of each. Dominant allele is a uh, refers to an allele that can mask the recessive allele. So this capital A, I think, should be dominant, meaning that in this scenario, you wouldn't even be able to tell that you have a little a, unless if you have children and do a genetic analysis on them as well. 
Otherwise, people would assume that you only have this capital A trait because that's the only one that would show. Recessive is the little a and can be masked by a dominant. So that means it'll only show if two of these little a's show up, which means usually it's a lower likelihood to have the recessive trait, such as in colorblindness. Genotype describes the type of alleles that cause traits in an individual. So this is the alleles themselves and genotype describes the type of alleles. Phenotype uh, refers to how the alleles show up. So while genotype is the actual uh, genes themselves, phenotype show is like how they show up. So this capital A, let's say it codes for, I don't know, all black hair. Then the phenotype will be all black hair and the genotype will be double A. So here's an example pedigree chart and this is how you can infer. So you can see that that is inflicted, the square. Square like, I don't know, men have square shoulders, sure. Uh, and then here, the woman is unafflicted, mother. So, but does this mean that the man is fully afflicted and the woman is fully unafflicted? Well, we can rule out the fact that the man is fully afflicted with a Punnett square, as that would mean that one of each, his children would both possess this dominant gene and both show the trait. So he must instead be heterozygous for the trait. Mom could, and I think mom will be... Uh, heterozygous. I think she could be homozygous in this certain uh, trait. And this is hand clasping, by the way. Hand clasping uh, left over right is more common, and it is the dominant. Vision. I think bad eyesight is actually, yeah, bad eyesight, near or far sighted, is actually dominant, which is kind of sad. But normal vision is recessive, and the fact that it's being shown in this daughter here shows means that both the father and mother, while afflicted, um, can still have a normal uh, eyesight child. And sorry, this uh, mother here cannot be um, cannot be uh, heterozygous as that would mean she would also show the trait, of course. So, on to Gregor Mendel, this wonderful dude who worked with pea plants, and bees, and mice to figure out his three laws of dominance, which IB has liked to cut down to two laws because the law of dominance is not a law to them. But it's still important. So it's just that uh, contrasting traits are across the offspring resemble one of the parents, which means that a homozygous, a homozygous and dominant parent, for example, this tall stem plant uh, crossed with a short stem plant will definitely produce lots of tall stem plants because it is impossible, if you check the alleles in this pedigree chart, for any of them to not possess one of the alleles from the tall stem plant. And... To possess one of them means that the dominance will show and they're all affected like this. So the genotypic ratio means that all are TT or 100% and the phenotype, as we mentioned earlier, is the actual trait. So Mendel self-crossed the filial generation offspring to each other. So she took these ones, the children that were now um, heterozygous, and he crossed them with each other, which is um, kind of weird, Mendel. I don't know why you're doing that. But what he created was this f2 generation and he noticed this ratio of one to two to one which lines up with the um punnett square math you'll be doing but the phenotypic ratio is three to one why because tt and t little t will show the exact same phenotype trait they're both tall and this only this one is short despite their genotypic ratio being different mendel did not find any intermediate forms yet um, so he came with the law of segregation, which showed that each individual must have two determiners called alleles, and half of them are from mom and half of them are from dad. Then there is sex, um, where males have 44 plus the XY, so that makes for 46, and females have 44 plus XX. So sex links traits, only X can carry um, traits, which is why some things like, um, I think, colorblindness, which is sex linked, it actually shows up in men more often than women because once they have an X, they have to show the trait. There's no way to not show the trait. So men will actually have a higher percentage rate of showing colorblindness. The law of independent assortment is that each trait is inherited independently from each other, which I think is also untrue later on. But when Mendel crosses pea plants, he would notice he would cross two characteristics at a time, and this was called a dihybrid cross. The 4x4 four four hellish cross. So you can use foil to figure out the genotypes and which gametes you need to cross. 
but you will get this massive 4x4. If you're crossing completely heterozygous for everything, heterozygous, 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 there's a golden ratio of 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 in this shape. And I think it's worth remembering because it'll save some time if they ask about it in a paper 1. Codominance. This goes against what Mendel was saying. So these were his two laws, laws and this is something else now. Codominance is where two different alleles can have can show both at once. So, for example, red-brown fur in cows, RR, and WW for white fur, but RW, none, neither of them are uh, recessive, both are dominant, and both show. So, it actually gives a roan co fur, fur color, which is not a biological term, it's just a color I don't know, but it's between red and brown and white. So, both phenotypes are expressed rather than, and there's no blending of the trait. So, this is codominance. So they're both expressed, but they're not blended up. So codominance and multiple alleles. This is also true for human blood types because we have A, B, AB, and O antigens. So type O, to, to be type O means that you have neither A or B. AB means you have both, and A and B, obviously. And we show this with an I, capital I, A, meaning that... Uh, it is the allele for the A antigen, B for the B antigen, and I shows no antigen. So if you have two I's, then you're a type O. You want to be friends with these type O people because they are known as universal donors. So yeah, here's a donor recipient chart showing that AB can receive from everyone because they have both A and B antigens, which means they're, uh, they won't attack the blood cells they're receiving. But O types can't receive from anyone except O's. And here's another example of codominance. There is sickle cell anemia. Because you can show the sickle cell trait halfway, which is really good because it protects you from malaria in Africa. But if you show it twice, then you're probably going to die. So this in-between is a much better uh, trait, and that's probably why it's still being propagated. Incomplete dominance is when two traits get blended up. So unlike the cow that showed both traits at once, uh, snapdragons, a type of flowering plant, show red flowers and white flowers, but when together, they are pink flowers, a blend. And okay, there's sex linked inheritance, which means that, so basically you can only follow the um, allele on X, and no matter how you inherit it, the Y won't have the allele. I think there was a guy called King Harry the F Henry V, who was trying to have a son, but he wasn't able to, so he kept executing his wives. But that was probably because his y, uh, y allele was messed up, and that's why he wasn't having uh, sons. Probably because he was unable to give the Y allele to create sons. So here is the hemophilia. Hemophilia is linked to sex linked, uh, sex linked traits. And you can be a carrier. So women can be carriers, but men cannot because, well, if they carry it, they show it. So they can, they're just known as a um, afflicted. Whereas women can carry the trait, but not have it. Men, they're screwed though. They just show it. So, yeah, it's also true for colorblindness. Widow's peak. Yada yada. Ah, uh, there's more mutations. There's genetic abnormalities. Point mutations. Deletion, addition, translocation. And it's just things flipping around, swapping around. Aneuploidy is... um changes in number and kind of chromosome and it's usually from non-destruction during meiosis one so here's a bunch of the um diseases that can occur there's Klinefelter syndrome which is xxy turner syndrome which is xo meaning you're missing one meta female which means you have an extra x chromosome you get learning disabilities jacob syndrome for xyy kridu sha uh part of chromosome five is missing and you will sound different Okay, polygenic inheritance occurs when two or more sets of genes affect the same trait in additive additive fraction. The result is a continuous variation of phenotypes between the extremes and distribution of these phenotypes that resemble a bell-shaped curve. So a distribution. Um, so for example, height. Height is not easily like you can't just cross a tall person and a small person, uh, a small, a shorter person. For a medium-sized person, it's a little more complex than that since there are multiple genes involved and multiple alleles. 
So instead you get this nice uh, curve where some people are very short, some people are very tall, but most people are going to be around the center. Skin type is also a uh, polygenic inheritance, which is why um, you'll notice that, for example, uh, lighter skin and darker skin will create an intermediate, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it'll be all the way dark or all the way light. It just depends on how much melanin you have, which was the result of the continent uh, you're evolved on because there's different exposure to sun and the skin needs different melanin amounts to block out sun, I think. Recombination and gene linkage. In dihybrid crosses, some offspring inherit a combination of characteristics that one of the parents had. So gene linkage means that they might inherit new combinations of characteristics that the parents did not have, and they'll be called recombinants because they're formed by recombination, so the parents did not have them, but the children do. And sometimes it's a result of crossing over for uh, genetic diversity. The recombination of unlinked genes are located on different types of chromosomes. So when homologous chromosomes pair up in meiosis, they are on different pairs. These pairs of homologs are called bivalents, and bivalents are oriented randomly on the equator, meaning uh, when they line up in a um, m- m- uh, metaphase which means that the allele of a gene moves towards the pole uh, unaffected by the other ways, the, the ways of the other uh, unlinked genes. This is the premise be- behind independent assortment of unlinked genes. It also allows the recombination of unlinked genes. Combinations of alleles inherited from a parent are broken up, and new combinations can then be formed by random fertilization. Some pairs of genes do not follow the law of independent assortment, such as the 9331 ratio for the 4x4 Punnett square, uh, when two genes are crossed. crossed. There were more offspring than expected with the parental character combinations, which means that the parents' uh, traits happen to show more than was expected mathematically. This is called gene linkage, where some traits are like kind of dragged along uh, for the ride. And that occurs when they're on different chromosomes. So this is an unlinked gene. They're on different chromosomes, so they're unlikely to be inherited together. But when they're on the chromes, same chromosome and very safe, uh, like their loci are very similar, the, it's more likely that during crossing over, this piece snaps off and they're both inherited together. So this is the case in some of these flowers. For example, they'll show data here. And rather than following this 9331 pattern, you'll notice that much more, um, much more are parents. So the expected is this uh, mathematical value down here, but more are observed to be parental, um, the same as the parental genotype, meaning that there's likely a gene linkage between uh, PPLL. Also true with fruit flies, the ebony gray body, ebony body and the gray body, the straight wing and curled wing. So it looks like that their gametes actually code and usually inherit the same is this linked it should be linked but yeah they're linked together and then they're inherited as such and these are offspring the offspring are recombinants because they create new characteristics that were not like the parents and in gene linkage there'll be more offspring resembling the parental phenotypes and the closer they are to each other the Oh, the linked genes are closer to each other. Crossing over, forming recombinants are less likely. Yeah. So new combinations from linked genes are very unlikely because of how close they are. This is the linkage notation. This is how you uh, indicate that CU and capital EB, CU, EB are linked. And the gametes will be moved together as so. So the offspring will actually, in reality, only be these two combinations. Whereas these four recombinants... Uh, the other two are much less likely. Yep, and that's it for genetics. Thank God.